and welcoming Professor Caroline Levine. Thank you so much, uh, Stefan, for that lovely introduction and, and Sebastian also for making this possible. I am so grateful for the chance to be there. I wish I could be there in person. I would so much prefer to meet and talk to people in an ordinary conference way, but I've been so mindful in writing about sustainability, about the high carbon price of academic travel that um, I really am happy for the chance to experiment. I know it's never quite the same as, uh, as as being an ordinary conversation, but I will put my email address up at the end of the of my PowerPoint presentation. So anybody who wants to have the kind of coffee conversation that we might have in person, please uh, feel feel welcome to email me and, and start a conversation that way. Um, I'm also really excited to be part of this conversation about narrative liminality. It's a term that fascinates me um, and it's making me think that I should use it in my own work. I've been writing a book about sustainability and I've been talking about a range of forms there, including rituals, murals, pop culture, pop songs. Um, and I've want, been wondering since thinking about this conference, how I might use the term uh, liminal narrative for those. But this book is also, the book that I'm writing is Narrative endings are more liminal than I've given them credit for before. And I've been reading happy endings in particular as what I've been calling thresholds to sustainability. So for many politically minded critics, and this included me for many years, the instability of the narrative middle is its most productive and, and politically radical part. This is where the text reveals social crises and contradictions. And in this context, happy endings are troubling they bring all the instabilities to maybe false and comforting resolutions that cover over the real economic and political forces at work. So if we think about novels that wrap up with bourgeois domesticity or individual career success for the protagonist, we say the happy ending is ideologically problematic. And of course, it's also cruelly disposed of characters along the way, like the mad woman in the attic or the queer lover, and it's no structural alternatives to the status quo. So I'm familiar with that argument, but I want to turn it on its head today to suggest that even the most comforting happily ever after narrative endings might be politically useful on the left. I'll give you my thesis first and then I'll unfold it in several parts. So my thesis here is that endings don't bring all action to a close, which is what the term closure suggests, but I think is not right. Instead, they show us stable routines that extend predictably into the future. There are moments when there's a transition from dramatic, exciting, and unstable plotted action to the promise of a sustainable life. The narrative end, in this sense, is more liminal than closural. It's more a transition to a new state than an ending. So in order to unfold this argument, this talk will have four parts. In the first, I'll talk about politics and think about specifically the problem of sustainability, which seems like the most urgent issue we face in this particular historical moment. Um, and there'll be two goals that I'll be focusing on in particular. Um, that'll be food security and shelter. In the second part of the talk, I'll turn to narrative and um, I'll think about how narrative endings model sustainability for us. And then I'll turn to brief readings of texts that uh, help me to make my case for sustainability as a possibility of narrative closure. The first reading is really very short. I'll be doing a very brief reading of Oliver Twist and a slightly longer reading of Evicted, which is Matthew Desmond's recent ethnography of urban, urban poverty in the United States. And that really does count, I think, as a liminal narrative. Okay, so first let me start with the political argument. For over a hundred years, critics and artists and leftist activists have put our emphasis on breaks and ruptures and instabilities. We've celebrated works of art that are challenging and anti-conventional. And this version of art has been powerful in part because it brings our politics and our aesthetics together into a neat political bundle, a revolutionary bundle. Since art refuses conventions and expectations, we say, it can also act as a resistant political force. 
the strange disruptions of the aesthetic challenge oppressive structures and systems and standards. These days, I want to make a hard turn away from this tradition. As neoliberal economics undoes hopes of secure work, and as fossil fuels disrupt longstanding ecosystems, what it seems to me we urgently need now is not more upheaval, but more stability. In fact, the right has been reveling in some of the same kinds of disruptions that we've often seemed to value on the left. Trumpism is nothing if not a smashing of norms and a disrupting of the formal work of governance. In the name of freedom from rules, the Trump administration has rolled back over 80 environmental regulations, including rules restricting greenhouse gas emissions, laws against fracking on native lands, drilling in wildlife preserves, and dumping toxins in waterways. So from this perspective, rupture can clearly serve the ends of injustice as well as justice, and right now it's quickly hastening the worst effects of climate change. In my search for alternatives to radical rupture as a politics on the left, I've been excited by the work of indigenous philosopher Kyle Powis White, who coins the term collective continuance. White argues against the common stereotype that indigenous societies are static. He makes the case that all collectives have to develop strategies for adapting to new conditions. So food, food systems, which are one of his main examples, are integral to the survival of communities, and so they have to be maintained over time, but they're also always subject to external forces that disrupt them, like storms and floods. Collective continuance, as he defines it, is a society's overall adaptive capacity to maintain its members' cultural integrity, health, economic uh, vitality, and political order into the future, and avoid having its members experience preventable harms. So uh, I really want to put my emphasis on the word maintain here um, and to suggest that white dissolves the conventional opposition between conservation and innovation or between traditional and modern societies to say that all societies face the question of maintenance. How do you maintain what you have in the face of inevitable change? So white's approach also focuses, and this seems to be really important, on the prevention of foreseeable future harm. So it's a fundamental ethical and political responsibility to try to ensure the best conditions for intergenerational survival. In my own work, I've been using the word uh, sustainability as opposed to collective continuance or using them interchangeably. And of course, um, it's clear that scholars in literary and cultural studies have roundly critiqued the term sustainability. So I want to spend a minute talking about why I'm using that term anyway. It's, it's, they're certainly right to critique it. If we sustain current systems and current ways of life, including global markets and extractive industries, we're just going to be complicit with the most rapacious forces on earth. But I've been thinking that Capitalism and our dependence on fossil fuels are themselves dra dramatically unsustainable. We all know that the pace of consumption and extraction right now is leading to, rapidly leading to an uninhabitable planet. So what I want to do is to, is to um, reclaim the word sustainability and to put my emphasis on the word sustaining. Like what does it take actually to sustain collective life? And here I want to use uh, White's term collective continuance. How do we continue collectives in the face of the existential threat of climate catastrophe? My central question and the work I'm doing right now is how can we imagine, design, and build just social forms that will afford the flourishing, the maintaining, the continuing of human and non-human life over the long term? So I want to focus here on two specific goals for a just human collective, and that is food security and shelter. And then I want to talk about the narrative forms that can help us to think our way to these goals. So I want to think about food security first. Around the world, millions of people are desperately longing for reliable, regular provisions of food. Adults in the US recently interviewed who don't have enough to eat report that they suffer not only from physical pains, faintness, uh, pain, weakness, hunger, but also from excruciating ongoing anxiety. So they th say things like, I'm worried, worried each day where the next meal is coming from. Always there's this sense of anxiety I'm feeling. 
When it comes to food and water, human bodies do benefit from routines, some measure of repetition and regularity. We have to return day in and day out to face the same necessities. Now, of course, it's possible to survive with unpredictable food and water, and many people have done so, but for most, that irregularity is painful and it can be torturous, even catastrophic. So routines are among the social forms that we've most reviled in the arts and humanities. We've actually defined art as that which isn't routine. But I wanna make the case for the justice and for the necessity of predictable routines to collective continuance. As for shelter, human bodies also need spaces protected from violence, from involuntary dislocation, and from extreme weather. Literary and cultural critics have tended to be quick to dismiss the value of shelter because we've so closely associated it with the bourgeois family home. But there's no reason why shelter must necessarily be organized around private property or the family. In extreme domesticity, Susan Freeman argues for reevaluating revaluing the benefits of stability for those on the margins. She focuses on examples of what she calls extreme domesticity, which are cases where queer, economically insecure, homeless, and displaced people fight to create shelter under inauspicious conditions. For most people, in other words, instability and unpredictability are not exciting sources of disruption, but massively unjust daily hardships. But if regular provisions of food and reliable shelter offer relief from pain and anxiety, they're also likely to be pretty boring aesthetically. Predictability means unspontaneous, uncreative, monotonous existence. Ongoing daily routines lack drama, innovation, and complexity. In this sense, I think sustainable life poses a major challenge for humanists and artists with our love of disruption and nuance, and also a challenge for popular uh, culture like news stories and plotted fictions, because these so often rely on spectacular events and suspenseful unfolding. So Rob Nixon's argument about slow violence has been very uh, formative for me. It's very hard to represent the slowness of the violence of say climate change because we're so used to sensational rapid uh, news stories. So the problem is not only that sustainability is politically and economically different, difficult, sorry, it's also specifically a narrative problem. And that brings me to the second part of my talk today. On the face of it, it seems tough to tell stories that get us to feel a widespread and passionate excitement about a sustainable life if what makes a sustainable life desirable is precisely its monotony, stretching on to, into the future without crisis or spectacle. I wanna put this in formal terms. Narrative form does not readily afford a celebration of routine or stability. D. Miller famously defines the narratable as dependent on a logic of disequilibrium, deficiency, and deferral. Plot depends on unsustainability. Until that is the end, the term closure suggests that narrative ending. My major point today is that coming to an end often means precisely showing us a sustainable future. So not endings as closure, but endings as sustainability. Specifically, endings gesture often to um, stable routines that extend predictably forward. So Anthony Trollope's Barchester Towers ends this way. Mr. Arabin, quote, preaches nearly every Sunday, and Mr. Harding does such duties as fall to his lot well and conscientiously. Not terribly exciting, but here narrative closure, um, importantly, doesn't entail the end of all action, but specifically the end of uncertain, sensational, plotted action in favor of regular and predictable routine. Of course, Trollope's conclusion might seem to exemplify the most conservative impulses of the realist novel. But I want to suggest here that routines um, shape, that shape narrative endings can also point to a more promising politics of justice. Take, for example, George Moore's novel from 1894 called Esther Waters. This is a novel about an illiterate servant who lives constantly on the brink of economic uh, 
collapse. She's precarious. She lives through numerous crises, pregnancy out of wedlock, the struggles to um, raise an illegitimate child, gambling wins and losses, trouble with the police, difficulty uh, finding food and shelter. The novel ends with Esther settling into a life of perfect regularity with her employer. In the final pages, they settle into a pattern of sewing, reading, sharing regular meals together, and going to Sunday meetings. Esther's employer asks her if she'd like to marry again, and she responds, marry and begin life all over again? All the worry and bother over again? Why should I marry? In place of the worry and bother of the marriage plot, the two women agree to work on, work on to the end. This is definitely not the stuff of narratable adventure, but it is for Esther the first genuine prospect of a sustainable life. Reliable food, safe shelter, regular work, and even the routine patterns of ritual, uh, of religious observance, which we might call ritual. So as in Trollope, what the end does is not to bring all action to a close, but to offer us the expectation of the same actions repeated over and over again into the future. So this is what I mean when I say that closure marks the transition or can mark the transition from precarity to sustainability. What narrative endings afford then is the promise of stable ongoing routines. And my point here is that that might not always be a bad thing. If this is true of food and water, it's also true of shelter. And here again, I turn to Susan Freeman who writes, desiring shelter is not necessarily conservative. Freeman reads a passage near the end of Stone Butch Blues, where the transgender character Jess creates a home after a long period of homelessness. Jess paints, cleans, buys linens and bath soaps at a department store. While critics have typically written off home decorating as weakly feminine and consumerist, Freeman urges us to see Jess's homemaking as a crucial piece of the struggle to survive an audacious effort to produce a basic sense of physical and psychic security by someone who has been repeatedly violated. Now you could say that we shouldn't look to narrative at all for models of sustainability, and I have been looking to other forms. As Elaine Scarry has argued, plots are organized around singular events and crises and so seek to avoid perpetual, repetitive, and habitual action. When narratives do refer to repetitive sequences, they typically op opt for synthetic formulations like every day or for years, and so condense um, elements like food or shelter into single descriptions that subordinate the unfolding of exciting, that are subordinated to the unfolding of excited and exceptional events. And that's why utopian novels, like William Morris's News from Nowhere, for example, which do dwell at great length on the smooth routines of a, of a stable life are notoriously boring. In this respect, plot lends itself more readily to disruptions than to the stability and predictability of routines. But I wanna suggest that there's something politically productive then in the movement between plotted instability and the routines that follow. Narrative disequilibrium or plot is great for getting us to think about experiences like hunger and homelessness. These are exactly the kinds of instabilities that can be easily used to propel a plot forward. That is, if the narratable is a logic of disequilibrium, deficiency, and deferral, then the logic of the narratable is also the logic of precarity, an instability, a yearning, an ongoing lack. So one thought I've had is that this kind of narratability could be especially productive for those of us who enjoy the benefits of both adequate food and stable shelter. I think it's really hard um, not to take for granted predictability and stability. So it's easy to crave instability when your basic needs are being met. It's easy to find security boring or oppressive when you're not facing the daily struggle to find food and water. So narratives organized around the longing for food security and stable shelter have the potential to get those of us who are economically comfortable to appreciate the value of predictability. As a form, plot a narrative is particularly good at pushing the most comfortable among us to yearn for a settled resolution to the distressing insecurity of hunger and homelessness. 
I've learned this in part from the Victorian novel, which is famous for its ideologically troubling resolutions, but equally famous probably for drawing our attention to the hardships of hunger and poverty. Um, and so I want to turn very quickly to Oliver Twist, which the whole plot of this famous novel is sparked by the condition of ravenous hunger. Oliver Twist and his companions, this is right at the beginning of the novel, suffered the tortures of slow starvation for three months. At last they got so voracious and wild with hunger that one boy who was tall for his age and hadn't been used to that sort of thing, for his father had, smelt, had kept a small cook shop, hinted darkly to his companions that unless he had another basin of gruel per diem, he was afraid he might some night happen to eat the boy who slept next to him, who happened to be a weakly youth of tender age. This threat of violence prompts Oliver, who himself is, quote, desperate with hunger and reckless with misery, to make his famous request. Please, sir, I want some more. This statement is a classic example of narratability, the logic of deficiency and deferral, and it's what gets the plotted adventure going in earnest. Oliver is forced into exploitative and criminal labor in order to survive. Dickens draws a public attention to the cruelty of the poor laws and the workhouse system, and uses Oliver's story to make poverty appear innocent because Oliver is angelic and not at fault for his own hunger and also intolerable. So we have, <coughs> excuse me, this boy is so hungry that he threatens to eat another boy and that instigates a whole novel's worth of excitement. It'll only come to an end once Oliver is adopted by the wealthy Mr. Brownlow and settles into a life shaped by the promise of ongoing plenty. Now, you could certainly argue that Dickens fails badly when it comes to structural solutions to poverty. Oliver's own situation is resolved only by a combination of unlikely coincidences, Mr. Brownlow's personal kindness, and his own saintly goodness. Near the end, Oliver tries to use his newfound wealth to save Dick, a childhood friend from the workhouse. Oliver says, quote, we'll take him away from here and have him clothed and taught and send him to some quiet country place where he may grow strong and well. But then Dickens doesn't actually imagine for us an entirely di different economic system that would guarantee food and shelter to all. It just focuses on Oliver and his one friend, Dick. And then as it happens, Oliver arrives too late even to save Dick. Uh, so even the single friend doesn't get saved. Dickens is not a revolutionary in this sense. But I want to suggest that the novel's plot has affirmative affordances for leftist politics anyway. It invites us to crave resolutions to the ups and downs of unjust scarcity and to replace them with a sustainable life. And though the fact that Oliver is a single virtuous protagonist does seem to focus us too much on individual solutions, the fact that Dickens brings in the unsavable Dick at the very end um, does suggest that he's broadening the frame to remind us of other potentially endless innocent victims who can sustain life under current conditions. So the novel hints at the potentially endless number of similar stories beyond the bounds of its own plot and suggests that Oliver's end won't be enough to save all the others. So in order to think this problem of structural change, I wanna end with a much more recent text. Oh, sorry. Sorry, that's from Oliver Twist, um, which uses some of the same narrative stra strategies as Dickens, but combines them with structural solutions for a sustainable collective life. Okay, so Matthew Desmond's uh, Pulitzer Prize winning Evicted is a 2016 ethnography of rental housing in poor areas of Milwaukee. And I think it could be defined as a liminal narrative in the terms of this context conference in the sense that it has lots of stories and it uses even some of the same narrative strategies as Dickens and the realist novel, but it combines them with structural, structural solutions for a sustainable collective life. So it's a sociological nonfiction, but it also has lots of narrative uh, pieces to it. It's intended to expose the huge rise in evictions in the US over the past two decades and spe specifically, and to offer policy solutions. It includes data, policy prescriptions, and an analysis of the history of housing policy. So it's been praised for its meticulous research and for its structural solutions, but it's also been repeatedly called novelistic. 
What interests me here is that Evicta does share some crucial forms of the novel, including some exciting plot lines and protagonists, but it also manages to combine these with a systemic analysis that calls for large-scale large structural change. So in terms of its narrative structure, Desmond gives us eight struggling renters, some black and some white, some in a trailer park and others in rundown city neighborhoods. Arlene, a mother of two boys, is one of the central characters. She's evicted initially because a stranger has broken down her front door and the landlord holds her responsible for the damage. As she struggles to keep her children under a stable roof, she often has to choose between food and rent, and also between rent and school clothes. Another character, Vanetta, is a mother of three who falls behind on her rent and electricity bills and is threatened with an eviction. And she's terribly worried that eviction will separate her from her children. And so scared she is that she takes part in a robbery to cover her bills. She's arrested, she's fired from her job, she's evicted, and she's separated from her children. Maybe surprisingly for a social scientist, Desmond gives us not only a set of sympathetic victims, but also gives us a villain. So one of evicted, one of evicted's most compelling characters is the landlord, Sharina. And if you've read it, you'll know that she's so deeply dislikable. She's determined to make as much money as possible from her tenants in the poorest neighborhoods in Milwaukee. This means that she evicts anyone who reports her own failures to keep up the property, including broken plumbing. And in one of her worst moments, after a fire that kills an eight-month-old eight baby, she celebrates the fact that she's not liable for any damages. But Desmond also makes it clear that Sharina's personal greed and selfishness are not the real cause of her tenants' woes. He shows how legal and economic structures allow landlords like Sharina to profit from the poor. For example, most landlords are reluctant to rent to tenants who've been evicted before, which means that a population desperate for housing will have to pay high rents for poor conditions. They just don't have any alternatives. Arlene is rejected 89 times in her search for an affordable apartment. So that, that means that eviction actually um, feeds a particular rental housing market. Desmond shows us that factors that range from segregating house, segregated housing laws to the collapse of the industrial sector are constraining the decisions that are made by both the victims and the villain. So what most clearly differentiates evicted from Oliver Twist is Desmond showing us in detail how government programs, laws, and economic patterns together shape the lives of both the mean-spirited rich and the deserving poor. Evicted's combination of novelistic forms like scenes of wrenching disappointment and loss and descriptions of social forms like eviction laws afford both painful individual stories and a powerful analysis of the relations between individual agency and large scale social structures. So we might have seemed, we might seem to have wandered very far from the question of sustainability. But I want to weave this reading of Desmond's ethnography into this talk because its plot is organized around the same problem that structures so many classic arcs of the realist novel, and that is the desire for a stable home. Desmond plots his subject stories around narratable instability, um, and he includes suspense, crises, surprises, resolutions, sometimes temporary resolutions, so, for example, when Arlene falls behind on rent, we wait in suspense as Sharina prepares to evict her. But then chance intervenes. Sharina shows the apartment to a young woman named Crystal, who says she'll take the apartment, but then agrees to allow Arlene and her children to stay there with her. And so we start a new plot, a very complicated story of Arlene and Crystal, which ends in physical violence and another eviction. Along the way, Arlene loses everything she's ever owned because she can't afford to store her things between evictions, in part because there's a whole industry of people making money off uh, renters who are evicted. And she's robbed of what she has uh, that she can carry with her. Rents rise, her children move in with relatives, and she borrows money to bring them back to her. In the final pages of the book, as the family settles into a new apartment without a stove or a refrigerator, Arlene's son fantasizes about becoming a carpenter so he can build her home. And Arlene says, I wish that when I be an old lady, I can sit back and look at my kids and they be grown and they, you know, become something, something more than me. And we all be together 
and we'd be laughing. We'd be remembering stuff like this and laughing at it. So here, Desmond gives us the husk of a happy ending without its actual fulfillment. That is, Arlene imagines what it might be like to conclude her own story happily, laughing together in a house built by her, her son, while in fact, she ends very close to where she began, in uncertain shelter with inadequate food. So Desmond uses insufficiency and instability to structure the story around the desire for security. But as Arlene's endlessly precarious story makes clear, that desire can't be properly satisfied under current conditions. But this isn't actually quite the end of the story. After all, Desmond writes an epilogue, which offers a second ending. Here he proposes that a well-designed universal housing, uh, housing voucher program could change the shape of all the lives we've followed here. So he uses the narrative arcs of the book with their multiple quests for stable shelter to set us up for the structural solution. Or to put this another way, Desmond borrows narratable insufficiency and desire from plotted narrative. And then, cannily, he doubles the experience of the happy ending. In the first ending, he reveals the conventional novelistic ending as nothing more than a fantasy. The family at home, rewarded for the mother's sincere hard work and love, is well-deserved, but tragically it can't be realized. In the second ending, Desmond shows us how the happy ending could still be fulfilled, though this time we see it take shape through large-scale social reform rather than the image of the single family at home. So the plot of Evicted isn't just an entertaining form borrowed from the popular novel uh, to, or movie to make a book appealing to a broad audience. Like conventional storytellers, Desmond does structure the propulsive forward movement of his text around pre precarious protagonists on a desperate quest to find a stable home. And it makes sense for the domestic novel to be a good model for a book about housing injustice. But in order to convince us that home should be a universal condition, a human right, Desmond teases us with the desire for a conventional family ending, only to switch it for a large scale political goal, stable shelter for all. So brilliantly, he has it both ways. He trains us to desire the security of regular food and protective shelter by showing us how precari precarity hurts sympathetic individual people we come to care about without encouraging us to double down on the separation of some lives, virtuous maybe, at the expense of others, which we might be more inclined to judge. He proposes stable shelter as a collective happy ending. So to conclude, I've been trying to think about aesthetic forms we need now in this age of precarity. It's estimated that 821 million people went hungry in 2017. About 29 million of these suffered from the acute hunger that was caused by climate change. These numbers will only grow as drought, storms, forest fires worsen, as sea levels rise, and as millions of people find themselves homeless and even more desperate for clean water and basic food. There are predictions that there may be a billion environmental migrants in the world by the year 2050. In this context, it's my own hypothesis that we urgently need to revalue stability, predictability, and routine, which are precisely the opposite of our usual values in the arts and humanities. To this end, I've been turning back to the form of the happy ending, which we've so often dismissed as conservative, but which I'd like to call instead conservationist. It's one of the best forms, I think, for provoking us to desire and resolve the transition from radical instability to collective continuance. Thank you.